the Nuclear Energy Institute in the U.S. predicts that we'll see a doubling of nuclear capacity in the United States in the next 20 years because of deployment of SMRs. Again, in the two decades, SMRs? small modular reactors. Okay. So in the last uh, uh, couple of decades, we never saw this kind of growth projection in the U.S. It was always seen that nuclear energy was an answer to the needs of emerging markets. And now it's very clear that it's an answer to France's energy needs. It's an answer to energy needs in developed economies, in addition to the emerging market needs. And it's the, our best solution for keeping the air clean and really having a solution that can help reduce global temperatures. Beyond the greenification idea, one of the catalysts driving demand for nuclear energy has been Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the issue with oil supplies there. It's been exactly a year since Russia invaded Ukraine. And yet I was surprised to learn that there are no sanctions on Russia's uranium supplies and that the U.S. actually uses, you said 60 percent, get 60 percent of its uranium from Russia? 60 percent of imports into the United States were from Russia, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And most uranium that uh, goes into, the, into Russia is converted and enriched further before it is uh, exported out. Suffice to say, the reason why uranium hasn't been sanctioned yet yeah. is really due to this incredible dependence that clearly the West and the U.S. has on this material. They're talking about replacing Russian supplies with Western supplies that have traceability and accountability and sustainability around how they plan to mine uranium, not engage in the acts of war and supporting military operations. First of all, this is decades in the making. After the end of the Cold War, the U.S. decided to sign a treaty with Russia to dismantle Soviet-era warheads, and that dismantled uranium that came out of those warheads became a cheap source of uranium for many, many years and destroyed the domestic industry in the U.S. A very important sign that speaks to your point that the U.S. government is as concerned as you are right now in talking about that is the launch of the Strategic Uranium Reserve. This is history in the making. Very recently was the very first purchase by the U.S. government of uranium for the government account to create the Strategic Uranium Reserve modeled after the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. If this doesn't tell you that the U.S. government is equally concerned about this vulnerability of, of no domestic capability, I don't know what will. The last time the U.S. government purchased uranium for the government account was the 1950s in the Eisenhower administration. And just a small plug for my company, we were awarded a piece of that business. So I'm very proud to say that after 18 years of building uranium energy, believing that the national security issue was an, an area that we wanted to address, just a few weeks ago, we successfully closed that, uh, that award and delivered uranium into the U.S. government for the maiden strategic uranium. And reserve. where are you producing the uranium? We provided that uranium from stockpiles that we had acquired through our inventory program. We were awarded this contract. But that wasn't, again, from production, but it was from our inventory that we had. Because it's that. still not economically viable for you to start up actual uranium production. We're seeking a $60 uranium price on a sustained basis in the spot market to restart production. Today, the spot price is at $51 per pound. But in fact, the uranium that we sold to the Department of Energy, the U.S. government, they purchased from us at just about $60 per pound. So it's also further validation. It's a data point that A, U.S. uranium prices will fetch a premium because that's a 20% premium to the current spot market. And that, in fact, prices are most likely heading in that direction because to purchase one million pound of uranium, the U.S. government had to pay $60 per pound. That was the clearing price. U.S. demand, as I mentioned, is 50 million pounds per year. So I think there's a very and strong And uranium argument is there. currently at around 50, about $50. Per $50. Pound. Yeah. It's actually down around 12% a year to date. I with all of these I, factors, how is this not being reflected with in the uranium? With all of these factors, market? the uranium prices should be north of $100 per pound. The reality is, over the last couple of years, they have already doubled. And uranium prices were as low as $25 per pound. And it's one of the best performing commodities. As you know, with any asset class, things don't just, don't just go up in a straight line. There are periods of pullback and consolidation. But the fundamentals in the uranium sector today, where we have a supply deficit, 
We have countries like Japan coming back, doing a total 180 on nuclear energy. All point to the fact that we need more uranium supplies that are not being built at $50 uranium. And historic uranium prices adjusted for inflation point to $100 to $150 plus per pound. In a world where we need uranium badly to keep nuclear power plants running, to get that carbon-free electricity, there's no doubt in my mind that prices, to your point, will go higher. What's interesting about that point is actually, um, and you're bang on about the fact that what that kind of brings us back to is we're solely focused on potential U.S. sanctions on Russia. But what Russia has done recently with the START Treaty that you alluded to also suggests that we may see Russian counter sanctions before we may see U.S. sanctions. Because look, at the end of the day, if you're Russia, your sale of uranium or nuclear fuel to the U.S. constitutes about $2 billion of annual revenue. That's small compared to the strategic uh, pain you can inflict on an entire market for electricity generation. 20% of U.S. electricity generation is nuclear power. And so uh, can't take your eyes also off of counter sanctions, which is something that Russia has shown it will play that card so if it's, needed. It's completely logical to think that could happen because it's happened on other commodities and, and areas with Russia since their Ukraine invasion. Many producers that are building new mines will need even higher uranium prices. We benefit from the fact that our U.S. projects are built, licensed, and not in a, in, in a stage where upfront capital needs to be uh, deployed to build the assets. We have fully built and operational and licensed processing plants and infrastructure in Texas and Wyoming. So we are more of a production restart uh, with past production history and so much more proven rat compared to a company that's undergoing permitting and will have a higher cost of capital and will still need to finance the upfront uh, construction related capital. So I think at the end of the day, companies that have production restart opportunities like ours uh, will most likely work with that $60 hurdle but I think prices will need to be well north of that for incentivizing brand new operations. Look, at the end of the day, uranium is less than 5% of the operating cost of a nuclear power plant. That's the good news. And in the Inflation Reduction Act, billions of dollars of tax credits were given to utilities, and they are now in the best and strongest financial shape they've ever been in, including receiving 20-year license extensions to operate the plants. What that means is that ultimately a move in the uranium price will make very little difference to the bottom line of the end user and the rate payer and higher prices will ultimately be the cure. It will incentivize new development. I am confident that this will lead to the rebirth of an incredible industry. The U.S. used to lead the world in uranium mining. Tens of thousands of jobs used to exist here in exploration, development and mining of uranium. Today, there's probably a few hundred people left employed in this industry. But just think about all the jobs that can be created. Why was that change? What, 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 what made that change happen? The end of the Cold happen? War. The end of the Cold War that I was talking about. When the Cold War ended and the switch to dismantle Soviet era warheads, again, that really destroyed the industry. And we're really going back to uh, a world where I think the prioritization over controlling our own energy supply chains is what's driving policy and economic rationale. And in that environment, domestic capabilities and domestic uranium mining, I think will really win the day. And in terms of securing supply chains and ensuring that you have access to what you need, we're seeing a curious development here at the Bank of Montreal conference in that we have a number of uh, car companies here, Tesla, Ford, to name a few. Well, all the lithium and copper and cobalt that's going to go building those uh, batteries for the electric vehicles, they need to be charged, right? These batteries don't just charge themselves. And what we're really going to see is that at the end of the day, uranium is a fuel that very much belongs in energy transition. An energy transition is really this electrification movement. Absolutely, I believe you're going to see that vertical integration in uranium as well. The same Teslas and Ford Motors and Mercedes-Benzes that are here at this conference today. And as you said, it's quite strange. We've never seen this before, uh, are looking to be vertically integrated. And we don't have to look that far. In the 70s, 80s, before the end of the Cold War, end users of uranium were vertically integrated. 
Oil and gas companies used to be in uranium mining. Utilities used to own uranium mines and mills. And so if we're going back to a playbook, which is a playbook that unfortunately it's a bit about deglobalization and it's a bit about switching away from Russia, then it's not some unknown. We've, we've, we've seen it before and we've seen what vertical integration is all about. And it's about securing supply. And car makers are doing it and other end users of these very strategic metals, which uranium is, will do it the exact same way. Especially if you see this sort of global split. Well, look, as I mentioned, uh, there's a whole uh, arena of players that haven't entered the uranium industry yet. As I mentioned, uh, major energy companies uh, that are oil and gas focused primarily, as you know, don't look at themselves as oil and gas anymore. They also want to decarbonize. 